responsibility to study the Bible and to show myself approved unto God. That's 2 Timothy 2.15. They also taught me way back then that as a woman, I could do anything that God asked me to do. I'm just very thankful for the teaching that I had at this little Quaker church because it established my belief in Jesus and it changed my life forever. At home, I'm thankful that my parents knew the Bible. My dad was very interested in prophecy. We had the whole set of Clark's Bible commentaries, plus many, many more. And he talked about prophecy a lot. And because he was interested in it, I became interested in it and I started to study prophecy. And I realized in studying prophecy that biblical prophecy came true 100% of the time. And knowing this and seeing this led me to believe that Jesus was who he said he was. And I'm just very thankful that the Holy Spirit led me to believe in Jesus Christ as my savior through my studying of the Bible. I had no brothers, and I was the oldest. We had cows, sheep, horses, pigs, and chickens. We had an outdoor toilet and a coal stove and one room for heat. And it was north of here, and it got cold. But I got up every morning before I went to school and hand-milked cows and milked them again when I got home. I helped take care of all those animals and I learned to love them, and they loved me. I had a relationship with those animals that was good and made me feel good. And I can also tell you that the first 17 years of my life, I scooped a lot of poop. <laughs> <laughs> we did our own butchering, and that was about the worst day of my life because my meat had a name. And you, most of you know I don't eat much meat to this day. It just changes your life when your meat has a name. As I look back on this, I realize what valuable life lessons this taught me. I realized and learned that not everything that happened to me in life was going to be easy, not emotionally and not physically. The rose garden is heaven. Earth isn't there yet. It also taught me a very valuable work ethic that I have never forgotten. And I'm just very thankful for that experience. As a young adult, I attended Indiana State University in Terre Haute, Indiana. I've heard a lot of people say that when they went to college, they lost touch with Jesus Christ, to some extent. I'm happy to say, and I'm very thankful, for the fact that I always felt Jesus with me when I was going to that school. My husband, David, was a blind date. He was a friend of my sister's boyfriend. When I met him, he had seldom gone to church, and he didn't know much about the Bible. He knew that I could not give up going to church and my beliefs. And he told me that he was not happy with his life. He wanted a change and that he was anxious to go to church and learn about Jesus. 
A few years after we were married, he accepted Jesus as his savior. And I'm very thankful for that. God blessed us with two beautiful daughters and they are both in church serving the Lord and believe in him. There is nothing that makes a Christian mother happier than to know that her children are believe in Jesus Christ and they are serving the Lord. In my old age now, I had always wondered what I would feel like if I really knew that maybe my death was imminent. When I was in the COVID ward, the doctor came in one day and he told me, I've got your oxygen set on 14. That's as high as we can do it. We may need to vent you. And he said, your survival rate is 50-50. I can tell you that I had a piece that passes understanding. I have never felt Jesus so close to me in my life as I did in that COVID unit. That taught me that he will always be with me when I need him. I am so thankful to Jesus for the love and mercy and all the prayers that you said to me that, I made, that made my recovery from COVID possible. The next part's gonna be hard for me. When David died last year, the love and prayers that I received from my family and from all of you was beyond anything I could ever have hoped for. And your love just keeps on coming. I love this church. I'm so thankful for Cedar Grove Methodist Church. And I have seen and I do see Jesus in all of you. I know that your reward will be great in heaven. I'm such a blessed and a thankful person to have had Jesus with me all my life and to know that he will be with me to the end. The thing I'm most thankful for is that my many sins have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. I have one more I'm going to read for you. It's from Peggy Westfall. And she writes, this time of the year, with all the upcoming holidays, it brings a lot of things to mind. I think one of the most precious, most important thing is thankfulness. On my long list of things I'm thankful for, I'd like to talk about some of my top ones. First of all, I'm thankful to have Jesus in my life. He is God's perfect gift to us, his only son. Jesus is always there for us, that we can go and spend time with him and worship him. We can ask for prayers, ask for forgiveness of sins, and give him our love and trust. I am thankful for this wonderful little church and the love and fellowship of all our people. This will be my definition of the true church family. Everyone works together to accomplish what needs to be done. I'm thankful for my family, even though I have many who have gone on before me, including my husband of 55 years and my youngest son. I'm thankful for the time that I had with them, and I'm truly thankful for the family that I am still able to enjoy spending time with and who show so much love and concern for me. One little thing that we do that I love is before sitting down to our holiday dinner, we all stand holding hands and go around to everyone, including the children, for each of us to say what we are thankful for. I am thankful for the comfort of my home and all the everyday things that are provided for me. I am thankful for my many years the Lord has taken care of me. Even though I could continue adding to this list, these are some of my important ones. I hope all of you have as many blessings in your life as I do. Happy Thanksgiving to all of you. Love, Peggy.
this morning, chapter 17, 11 through 19. It's a very familiar passage of scriptures used many times on a day like today. <clears throat> now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. Thus ends the reading of God's word, and we pray his blessing upon it. The story of the ten leopards is a testimony to the healing power of Jesus Christ. But it's more than that. It's a witness of gratitude from a man who was brought from death to life. And this is what sets the story of the ten leopards apart from other stories of healing in the New Testament. Of all who were healed in the New Testament that we have record of, only one leopard came back to say thank you. Now, in the days of biblical time, we find that all skin issues was labeled as uh, leprosy. The priests were given the authority to state that a person who had a sore or an outbreak on the skin, a skin disease, had had leprosy. And that word was binding upon the entire community. Now, today we know that leprosy is diagnosed as Hansen's disease. It is treatable by medical professionals. The skin disease of the first century, as we said, was not necessarily Hansen's disease. While some of these diseases may have been fatal, others were not. But without knowledge of all the skin issues, the Jews lumped everything together and said that the person was infected and had to be uh, set apart from the community. He was spiritually unclean and socially unfit. So for many, the statement a diagnosis of leprosy by a priest was a death sentence. It was assumed that the person was being punished for some sin they had committed. So all the people with the rashes and sores were banished according to the law of Moses. In Numbers chapter five and verse two, it reads, put out of the camp every leper and everyone who has an issue and whoever is unclean by the dead. So for the Jewish people, it was a matter of life and death. An infectious disease could wipe out the entire community. Now the lepers, they had to dress in a certain fashion. And if approached by others, they had to shout out a warning, unclean, unclean. And that warning comes from the book of Leviticus. The leper in whom the plague is, is shall wear torn clothing and the hair of his head shall hang loose. He shall cover his upper lip and cry, unclean, unclean. One has written that the suffering of the leper of biblical times was due in many cases to the treatment by the religious community. Now lepers were separated from the family and friends and they sought out company of other lepers. They congregated in the wilderness to comfort and to care for one another as they suffered and died in exile. It was a small leper group that encountered Jesus on his way through Samaria, a border area. Ten lepers dressed in torn rags, bodies with covered with sores, crying at the top of their lungs. And they cried out, Jesus, have mercy on us. Now, for some unknown reason, when approaching Jesus, they did not cry out unclean, unclean. They were actually disobeying the law of the land of that time when they cried, Jesus, Master, have mercy or have pity on us. 
How did they know Jesus? Why didn't they warn Jesus? Luke does not give us any reason at all. He only writes the words of Jesus. Go and show yourself to the priests. These words of Jesus are important to us today. He treated the lepers the same way that he treated everyone else. He didn't rebuke them, criticize them, or question them if they were worthy of his attention. Over in the book of Acts, when Peter went into the home of Cornelius and the Spirit of God was present and Cornelius was not a Jewish person, Peter was able to say, I most certainly understand now that God does not show partiality or favoritism, but in every nation the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Therefore, we say that the only condition to receiving the grace of God and love is your need of him. This is what Jesus said to the Pharisees. It is not those who are wealthy or healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. Those who are healthy have no need of physician, but those who are sick do. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And so Jesus said to the lepers, go and show yourself to the priest. Jesus did not circumvent the authority of the Jewish community. The priests were to have the final word to declare if a person had leprosy or if he was cleansed. That was his responsibility. And that was done in, in accordance with the law, and Jesus did not challenge it. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told his disciples, Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I came to fulfill. So the lepers were told, Go and show yourselves to the priests. They heard the words of Jesus, and they turned. In obedience to his words, and they were healed. We can only imagine the joy of the lepers. They could join their family in community worship in the synagogue, be with their family and friends. They could move about the community because of their healing. It was a joyful time. But one of the ten lepers, seeing that he was healed, turned back, praising God in a loud voice, and fell on his face at the feet of Jesus, giving thanks to him. And Jesus then asked that question. Were there not ten cleansed, but the nine, where are they? Dr. Luke, the writer of the book of Luke, he inserts those few words, and he was a Samaritan. Thus implying that the other nine were Jewish. Were the Jews in that crowd that day That'd be like a slap in the face or an insult for Jesus to even converse with a Samaritan. But as we think back about scripture and think about the story of the good Samaritan, Jesus speaks of him and what he did as he's a good neighbor. And what about the woman at the well? Jesus spoke to her and she accepted him and she went out and confessed Christ to her entire community. So this is not just an isolated incident. Jesus was reaching out. So consider the question. Why did this one leper turn back? Was he more grateful? Was he more righteous? Was it because that he was a Samaritan and he could not enter a Jewish temple at all? Was this a sign on the door way of the temple that said no foreigners allowed. He could not even enter into the court of the women, the outer court. And perhaps he did not even have a priest to go to. So there was no restriction on him. He was free to do as he pleased. And what did he do? Now it seems that the nine leopards were so intent in fulfilling their ritual of the community 
the requirements of the law, they failed to recognize the one who'd come to give them life. In contrast to the nine lepers, the most important thing for the Samaritan was to do was to thank God for what he had done through Jesus Christ. It was more important to thank Jesus than to fulfill a ritual task. It was more important than going home to his community and showing off his deliverance from that sin that he had. It is more important to say thank you to Jesus. It was more important to express his gratitude to the person who healed him. It was more important to worship the Christ when he fell prostrate at his feet. I want to conclude this morning with just a few questions for you. When God touched your life in the past, what did you do? Think about it for just a minute. And God has touched our lives over the years as we think about the past and Thanksgiving days and those things that we've gone through as individuals. What did you do? Did you run and tell your friends? Or did you kneel down and say thank you to Almighty God? When God touched your life, when you knelt on an altar of prayer, or wherever it might have been, did you jump up and run home and tell somebody something? Or did you stay on your knees long enough to say thank you, Lord? Think about those things of the past where God has acted in your life. What have you done? Now think about the present day and the future. If God touches your life in some special way, what will you do? What will you do? Because we do not know when God's going to touch our lives in some way that may change our life. But our prayer is that you do as a leper. You may not fall down on your face before the altar or people, but you find a place of silence, meditation, and say, thank you, Lord, for your wonderful gifts you've stowed upon me in the present day and what's happening. And may you give thanks for his wonderful plan of salvation through Jesus Christ, his son. What will you do when God touches your life? Amen.